Hello friends, in this video we're going to look at this Bose LSPS speaker system. My brother just picked this up at an auction. As you can see it has some physical wear on it, but aside from cosmetics appears to be in good shape all around. One of the things that's kind of a mystery about this is that uh, how to connect it to something else. We'll look at the connectors on the back and get some more idea of uh, what the puzzle is. So I've turned it around, turned it on its side. I'm going to tilt the camera to get a close-up of the ID plate. Bose LSPS speaker system. See if we can find a date. Copyright 2001. So we know that this is from 2001 or later. It says manufactured under license from Dolby with Dolby logos on it. So we can reasonably assume this is a multi channel Dolby speaker system, probably a 5.1 system. Now from the size and dimensions of it, I know that this is a subwoofer, primarily in the box, and also from these connectors, we can tell that it's a uh, signal processor and amplifier. So I'm going to tilt that around and we'll take a better look at it. Here it is oriented a little better so I can see it at least. We've got, it says front, left, center, and right. Surround, left, and right. So this is a five channel system with the subwoofer that's built in making it a 5.1 channel system. Power switch, power cord, this is a standard type of power plug that, like you have on computers and monitors and things. Those are widely available. These are RCA uh, connections so that's easy. Now it says audio input here. It has this mysterious thing that looks like and I verified is an RJ45 connector which is the type that you're used to seeing on network cables. We got this little four position dip switch which I've found from the research that I've done uh, is essentially a unit code for the remote control. So I guess they wanted you to buy several of these and then run each one with its own code from a certain remote control. Now the intriguing thing here is this doesn't have analog inputs. We can reasonably guess that it's an amplifier and a signal processor as well as a subwoofer but there's a problem in terms of testing it for resale as far as what inputs to put into it to see that it works. So in the research I've done I haven't been able to get any real definitive answers but it looks like essentially this is designed to be used with something they call the Bose Music Center and I think they had different generations of those but my brother didn't get that in the auction so that's not available for me to test with and what I can do at least for purposes of this video and maybe for figuring out what's going on here I can take this black plastic cover off now in a previous video that I did that turns out is one of my most popular is um, I took apart a Bose subwoofer that had a built-in amplifier and I later realized a signal processor that probably has some similar functionality to this but that was a a pretty sealed up unit and didn't have this type of plastic cover that could be taken off pretty easily so I'm guessing what we'll get here when we take the cover off is basically the sealed unit for the subwoofer itself the amplifier section is going to be probably under this cover which gives it the air vents that an amplifier would need and then we're going to see if we can tap into these 
with audio, analog audio. So my guess is that this needs digital audio only that comes from this music center unit. So for reselling purposes, if we can show that this is a working unit, it has more value, otherwise it'd have to be sold as a parts or as is, which greatly lowers the price. And on the other hand, if you were to buy one of these music center things, you know, that's more expense, although you could resell the music center thing later. So the ideal thing is that I'll be able to pop this off and tap into the analog inputs if it has any and test it that way. So we'll see what's going on in that regard. Now the fact that this is a digital type cable kind of makes me think that we really don't have much hope of putting in analog audio here. If we have to inject it somewhere inside the unit, that's probably not going to be very practical either. So let's pull the top on this with after having ruminated on all the possibilities and see what's inside. I've taken a look at the screws for the first time. Screw is missing here, present here, present here, and missing there. So that makes me think that somebody popped the top on this already and put it back on. Who knows if the prior owner was a hobbyist or just, you know, owned this for his own use. So with just two screws to take out, that was pretty easy. We're going to see what the process of pulling this off is. And my normal method is to, that we do this together meaning that you're watching me figure it out live. Okay, so it looks like this has to slide off of the these things that stick out of the bottom. That makes sense. Just going to finagle this. One of the things about this unit is it's extremely heavy, as in it may be 50 pounds. It doesn't have any handles, so it's pretty hard to deal with when you're trying to take things off like this. I'm going to cut away here and pull that off and get back to you. So it turns out it was easily easy to just slide off. Now this is interesting. We can see that there's more to the puzzle which is this very large heat sink unit. Maybe this is where a lot of the weight comes from. A lot of, got a lot of Cast iron here, I assume. More screws that can be taken off. You see some of those are already missing. This one is kind of loose. So we can reasonably assume that someone has taken this apart before. Not that that tells us anything, but just kind of a point of interest. So having picked this up a little bit from the back end, I'm getting an appreciation for the fact that it's very back heavy. Taking out all the screws. Take out this last one here. Hope the thing doesn't fall down. Okay. Let's see if I can do this without hurting myself or the unit. So Now, as I suspected, what we see here is a totally enclosed unit that has just this one connector that goes to the rest of it. So basically, the rest of this box is essentially a subwoofer with an acoustic enclosure. Now I covered subwoofers in uh, a separate video, kind of the general design of subwoofers, but as a real quick review, this has a driver element, a mostly empty box, and some form of porting hole. Uh, we might be able to peer through the front screen and get an idea of which is which. You may or may not be able to see all that from the front, but this is a modular unit in the sense of you know, truly 
this is the expensive part this is the cheaper part from a reuse standpoint this could be repurposed into a subwoofer that's just driven as a speaker element with some other amplifier so there's nothing magic about this amplifier it's just the design that they had so you can imagine from a modular point of view or a, or a resale point of view someone could take either of these pieces and uh, you know if they had the other one that worked they could uh, just interchange them very easily this is really it's heavy but from a modularity standpoint it's really easy to deal with just one big piece so we're going to take the next cover off of here it looks like this lives inside kind of a metal shell appears to be cast iron I'm going to take these around the outside off and maybe the ones on the inside are connecting to things that actually live inside the box I've got six screws that I pulled out that are all identical now we're gonna have to finagle these things again on the side in some way I'm gonna maybe pull on this end first before I do that I'll just note that um, the metal here it provides electrical shielding which is of some value but the fact that they used a lot of metal here makes me think that they're trying to spread uh, the heat around as much as possible onto these fins so this has so much metal mass that the heat is just gonna kind of work its way around to all of the fins before anything inside gets gets too hot on its own so let's go ahead and pull this out if I can might be some prying involved let's see actually I'm gonna take some more screws out here we'll see how that goes doesn't seem to be budging as it is okay I've got them loose but they're kind of hard to get out so we're going to do some magnetic magic okay Let's see if it's loose yet okay very much loose so we'll make some adjustments do the grand unveiling and the winner is more stuff okay danger high voltage that explains a few things so this has a switching power supply I would assume they're talking about high voltage here we've got a row of power amplifiers at least over here these it looks like are bridge rectifiers maybe I've seen this general type on the other Bose unit I took apart so this appears to be the processor board I see shark analog devices which is the processor that the other one had hoping this is a fairly easy modular type system so it looks like I would need to pull this connector off and maybe be able to lift up this board I'm not gonna poke on the interior of the board it says danger high voltage on this whole section so that tells us that um, that really is a switching power supply you can be pretty sure that AC comes in here goes around now on a visual inspection for resale purposes I don't see any visual problems 
don't see anything charred or smoked here everything looks very normal it's, you know you can tell it's not a brand new unit it's seen some seen some age but uh, uh, you know nothing to be concerned about yet from a functional point of view let's look at this back shell so this appears to be cast uh, aluminum maybe uh, let's find out with our magnet okay okay so that doesn't stick to the magnet so it's aluminum however this braid does so this is a conductive braid that's essentially seals out any RFI from this um, from the interior of the unit so what I can imagine happening here is we're going to have some RFI generated by this switching power supply these are probably transistors associated with the switching power supply but you can see this whole section is kind of sealed up in an RF sense the audio section over here is separated and it's got this wall in between so that means that the audio section is not going to be affected by the RFI from the switching power supply and that also you know protects the outside world from the RFI which is always a concern uh, when you're working with a sw switching power supply design you need to do that we can go ahead and look at this board which is pretty basic here's the connector for the power supply input back side of the power switch little fuse um, and the 115 that comes out of that section going into the power supply so I can really anticipate that we could probably lift this whole unit up uh, realistically this has been off for so long we probably don't have to worry about high voltage but I take a pretty conservative approach on that so I'm gonna leave it for now or at least try to discharge any high voltages that may be hanging around from capacitors taking our tour a step further we've got this little analog output board here which contains the RCA connectors we've got this input board here which goes straight towards this signal processor board in fact may even be one big board I think it is actually so that's pretty much our answer right there to the basic question is is there any way to inject analog inputs into this and really the answer appears to be no so for resale purposes it may still make sense to do a visual inspection by pulling off this uh, power supply board I'm going to work on making sure that's safe and then we'll pull that off and see what's underneath it maybe nothing but just a lot of empty space a lot of various uh, passive connectors and components and you know uh, there may be a lot of volume there to kind of hold some high uh, capacitors you know some vertical can capacitors so I'll discharge this and we'll be right back. I realize looking this over that it's kind of hard to know what to discharge or how to discharge it. Um, here we have, it says 230 volts there. 340 volts is listed here. This round area here is probably an electrolytic capacitor that would hold all the 
all the store charge. This appears to be a power connector really for the other two boards. So we've got essentially a power amplifier board here and a signal processing board here with separate power going to each of those. I've been able to pull off this uh, 115 volt input easily. So I think what I'm going to do, since I don't know exactly what to discharge, I'm going to just pull this off with some safety gloves on and uh, kind of set it aside and it shouldn't be dangerous from the top or at least we can see where the dangers are if any. So this is one of those don't try it at home kids thing. I'm using uh, these are some fisherman's gloves that I got somewhere but they have these big rubber fingers on them and it's hard to believe that I couldn't get too hurt with that. I'm going to pry this up with a screwdriver. Okay, so that seems to take this digital board along with it, which is associated with these two connectors. Pull that out. Just pull it straight up. Okay. As I had suspected, this is all the earmarks of a switching power supply. Got some power transistors over here. Here are our big capacitors that hold uh, whatever stored voltage. This looks like a full wave bridge rectifier, some inductors, uh, a little bit of heat sinking, miscellaneous components. And this is the high frequency transformer. So that's something I can just set aside and, uh, you know, with the bottom of it covered, it isn't really a safety issue. Really the only safety issue with this totally unplugged is possibly stored in these capacitors. We may look at those separately. Now from a salvage or reuse point of view, visual inspection of this let's get it back into view here so visual inspection of this shows that it's absolutely fine from a visual standpoint capacitors are in good shape looks brand new because it's been sheltered inside the unit uh, nothing burned or toasty so visually speaking this passes. Now I'm not going to try to take out the analog board. But we can look at a little bit of the construction. They've got this rubberized uh, heat uh, heat transfer material. I've seen that before. You can see that the these power amplifiers are all uh, physically push down on that same pink stuff that goes to the chassis. So we'll test the chassis for magnetism. I assume it's aluminum also. So in retrospect nobody uses cast iron anymore so that was kind of a goof on my part. But this is how we learn. Now it looks like this can be just kind of pulled out of its slot, maybe at an angle. So there is a little bit of goo here that uh, holds it in. I'm discharged on the mat so I don't have a static hazard. Um, so this is actually pretty similar topologically into the other board that I've took apart from the other subwoofer that had kind of a similar capability. Shark processor, 
maybe some RAM chips. Crystal is the company that makes uh, analog input output chips, usually called Codex. So that's probably what this is, is a high precision combined A to D and D to A converter. Um, this might be the uh, flash memory chip, some miscellaneous interface chips, power conditioning and so on. Um, this is probably part of a little buck converter that maybe takes 12 volts down to the 3.3 that's used on the board. This, I don't know what it is, it seems to have a heat sink aspect to it. So no telling what that is. So here are the fingers that go with the matching connector over here. And this connector goes with this connector on the um, on the amplifier board. So again, visually speaking, there's absolutely nothing to be concerned about here. And also, I can reasonably say that what I feared would happen is that this can't be tested without the matching music center unit. So basically, I'm going to be putting this back together again. One thing that we have a possibility on from a resale point of view, we might be able to sell the two units separately if somebody wants that. Or, you know, the simple thing is to put it completely back together and sell it as one unit. So we'll look around and see what the common market need is out here. Here are the three transistors that uh, run the switching power supply that attach to this overall chassis through this rubber thermal gasket. So we'll put it all back together again and show you the finished result. So as I put this back together again just for fun I'm going to measure the voltage on these two capacitors. The smaller capacitors whatever that are around here aren't a, aren't a hazard concern. We can also look at the ratings on these. 470 microfarads at 250 volts. There's two of them which may have been used in parallel or series. So this is one here and this is the back side of the other here. So I'm taking the conservative approach and assuming that these are live but the honest truth is that I'd be very surprised if they were. So I just tested those separately. It wasn't feasible to hold the camera and all the equipment and everything so I didn't show you that but basically we are safe to handle it at this moment because they tested as having zero volts on them as I expected. So this basically just sits in here and should pinch onto these other two boards if everything's seated correctly. So that's a success. I'm going to go ahead and push these down. There may be... Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. There's rubber on this side that pushes these down. These need to be in physical contact with this rubber material in order for it to do its job. Just like any other thermal conduction process, everything has to be physically touching. One other detail we have is to plug this back in. Nice latch out of that. Now we're ready to put the lid back on. See if I can do that one handed. So as I'd kind of suspected, these four screws are interior that map to the uh, power amplifier section. 
the rest of this just seats on there very nicely I'll put the screws back in so I got the uh, electronics module all put back together that went quite easily all we have to do would be to connect this on to this connector which is quite easy but before I do that I want to show you the other one that I did recommend you look at the video for that if you're interested but this shows you some idea of what's inside this box now I found that I couldn't as you can see I had to take a saw to this to get it open so this box is not designed to be serviceable I'm assuming they use the same method uh, there's really nothing to fix here you blow out the driver you know that's the expensive part anyway but this unit appears to be the kind of the little brother so to speak of the unit that's that we're featuring in the video today and had similar processor probably less overall watts but that shows you some idea of what's inside here here's the speaker driver element the porting hole and in this unit there's a porthole on the front and then a kind of a blank space on this side that the sound can move around through this slit but I think it primarily projects out of this porting hole here so that's just to kind of give you an idea of what we can't see inside this box so I'd forgotten which way everything orients here but they've got things built on so you can't do it wrong here the connector goes on like that here there's a key slot that goes with this nub so it goes back on like that and we'll put the screws back in and look at the finished unit next so I've got the uh, amplifier processor module hooked back up to the box we're going to put this lid on well after doing quite a lot of fiddling with this I eventually figured out that I'd put these two screws in and that was blocking this cover from going on so I'm gonna leave those out it turns out this slides on very nicely I think so I popped that on as kind of a two-handed job I'm gonna put in this screw here and we've got two more that go with the plastic cover put those on okay it's all back together again I discovered in the process of reassembly that this cover comes off fairly easily seems to be some sort of a pinch type adhesion so we've got these two large drivers they're both in perfect shape by all appearances uh, a little plastic structural piece and this is the porthole that I knew it must have Let's see how far back we can go there so we can see all the way in there that goes straight back has a sloped plastic piece back there that maybe directs the sound gently and then we can reasonably assume that this whole cabinet is empty I could potentially take out and look at these uh, driver elements but I don't think that's worth messing with because we kind of know what's in there just some wires and an empty cabinet This thing that holds the grill is kind of interesting. It's kind of a 
pinch cloth of some sort. See if I can get this back in with the camera rolling. Oh, I see. I have to squeeze it a little bit to get it to stick. Okay. Uh, that may be another two-handed operation, so I'll work on that separately. Well, it turns out it was a two-handed operation. Basically a lot of strategic pushing to get this pinched back on both sides. So, as one more test that I can do without the music center unit, I'm going to plug this into an outlet, measure the power that it draws, and kind of get some idea of whether that's in a reasonable range. I don't really know how much power it should draw, but my guess is that it could be either absolutely zero, because it may need a uh, control activation signal from the other unit, or it could be some really small amount that's, you know, a few watts for kind of ambient power, but it shouldn't be very much. If it's a lot, then that means we know we've got some sort of major electrical problem. So here's power plug I pulled off the shelf. Got a large collection of these things from different purposes. Let's see, turns around this way by feel. Goes into there like that. I don't remember whether the unit's in an on or off state, but We'll just try it out here. Go to watts. Zero it shows. I'm going to flip the power button underneath. 11 watts. So overall that's a, a reasonable value. It shows that uh, you know we're drawing some ambient power but it's not very much. This would draw a lot more power if it was actually you know receiving a signal and driving something. So I consider this 11 watt reading to be a kind of a general good sign without knowing for sure what it should be in this state. Turn that off again. Goes to zero. So the on here could be considered kind of a standby power Probably a unit like this would be left on all the time, but it would be activated with through the digital interface by the Music Center unit. That completes our tour of the Bose LSPS speaker system. We took it apart, did all the checking that we could do without actually having the specialized Bose Music Center unit drive it found a digital signal processor, uh, multi-channel power amplifier, and a switching power supply inside, as well as two large speaker driver units and a porthole. So at the level I can check this, this looks like a perfectly good unit. Uh, the cosmetic problems aside, there's no reason to believe from a physical inspection that this is uh, faulty in any way. So that completes our video today. Please consider giving me a like and subscribing if you're not already subscribed. Thanks for watching and bye bye.